Hello my fellow gamers and welcome to this complete overview of update 3 for Going Medieval titled New Resources and Cultivation. My name is Peter and I am going to show you everything that is new and explain major and minor changes to the gameplay. First I will lay out the important bits and then we will dive into the separate subjects in more detail. One of the most notable changes is that settlers will start to age and eventually die. They will have different modifiers at different life stages and receive birthday presents in form of random perks. Additionally, they will start to have dreams when they sleep and the rebellious and merry states have been tweaked a little bit. Equally important are the new seeds and saplings and all other changes and improvements about growing crops, like new harvesting control and behavior for settlers and crop fields, along with the new event Crop Blight and new flora like apple trees, wild flax and wild barley. After that I will talk about the new resources like silver, wax, honey, tallow and ice blocks, along with the new food and items you can make out of these like the new silver arms and armor. This update also brings all the already announced new production, workplace and social structures like the ice box, skep, merchant stall and caravan halt. As you can expect, this means new research tech options like beekeeping and ice making. A lot of what you have been requesting for new visual variations of structures have been added with this third content update, like new styles and shapes of roofs, walls, floors, fences and marlons. Besides that, clay and limestone brick arches are now introduced as construction options instead of just wooden beams. Another notable change, and one which might throw a wrench in a lot of your designs, is the introduction of the fuel system, meaning you will have to supply braziers, torches and candles with fuel like coal, wood, sticks, tallow and wax to keep them burning. There are a number of other changes, big and small, like new warfare items, new materials for shields and armor, which now also have your settlement's heraldry on them. Enemies will have equipment appropriate to their factions and raiders, as well as merchants, will have women among them, not just men anymore. Animal husbandry has been added to the jobs list because of beekeeping and two music tracks have also been added to the game. A very important change you should be aware of is that there is now a cap on the amount of experience a settler can gain per skill per day. Besides that, there is also skill experience decay now. As for the interface changes, you'll be happy to learn that the camera will no longer be jumping to the merchant's location once that event happens. Developers have implemented a new tooltip system and the bartering and caravan screens now have sorting arrows. The non-tradable items are located at the bottom. Now I will use several settlements to go into the details of all of this. One I have presented to you in my player construction showcase series before, link up here and below, and another I will showcase in future episodes. The simplest of these new additions to the game's map vegetation are wild flax and wild barley plants, as well as apple trees for whose saplings you have to trade for while hay crops have been removed from the game entirely. Hay is now found only in the wild and when harvesting barley. These new wild flax and barley plants not only show up on new maps started after update 3, but also grow on them over time. They look different and produce less resources than the domesticated farmed versions, but are vital for obtaining your first seeds. As I said in the beginning of this video, seeds are now a thing and you can no longer plant crops you do not have seeds for. You will not even see crop fields offered in the build menu after you unlock the agriculture tech until you collect the seeds for each individual plant. Besides crops and berry bushes, trees are also affected by the update as cut trees now drop saplings, except when they are already dead, so no major foresting can be done without first cutting down trees. This is another change that will shake up your new playthroughs. Some plants do not have seeds per se, but you plant what you harvest, like red currants and barley, which is quite realistic. All plants will from now on drop seeds in their ripe phase, but there are certain plants like cabbage, carrots and beets that give more when in their flowering and seeding phases 
as each plant has its own natural cycle. This will, of course, bring a whole new level of complexity to farming and harvesting mechanics. Not only do you have to be more involved and make more decisions, but more storage space will now be needed for all the seeds and saplings. This is exactly why the developers have introduced new harvesting controls and behavior for settlers and crop fields. These now have a new option panel when you select them. Here you will find options like crop field priority, don't sow, harvest phase, cutting phase and changing crops. So what do these do? Well, crop field priority lets you choose the priority of that crop field much like you can choose the priority for which stockpiles will be filled first. This gives you a way to plan which crop fields your settlers will work on and in which order, no matter the job, sowing, cutting or harvesting. Don't sow option is just that. You don't remove the crop field, but nothing will be sown on it once its current plant is harvested. Harvest phase option lets you choose at which growth phase that particular crop field is harvested. This helps you harvest seeds or produce before weather turns to the worse, if you are in a hurry to move that field or if a blight has started. More on that in a moment. The cutting phase option is for tree crops. You need it because some trees, like apple trees, have different phases for harvesting wood, sticks and apples. Changing crops option is an easy way to rotate crops and switch them for another type. Do note, the current crops will be cut down and potential resources might be lost. So about that crop blight. This is a new event that can happen during summer and autumn. It's random and shows up on random crop fields, spreads and destroys the plants. Luckily, it only affects flax, barley, cabbage, carrots and beets. What should you do once you get a blight event? Cut down infected plants and prevent its spread. This is where those new crop field controls will come in handy to prioritize entire fields for cutting or harvesting at once. A good way to avoid the spread of blight is to keep your crop fields small and isolated from each other. Do not be alarmed, but there is one more important change to how plants work and this I'm sorry to say affects my underground village the most as well as yours if you have been using my underground greenhouses tips. Plants will now die if they are under a roof and new crop fields won't be sown there. In other words, plants won't grow without sunlight, which of course makes all the sense in the world, but I was hoping we would get to plant mushrooms in underground farms instead of plants. Another set of bad news for plants in crop fields is that weather events like hailstorm or frost will damage them and reduce the amount of harvestable produce on them. So all in all, I hope you have huge food stockpiles in your settlements because all these changes being made at the same time will have a major impact on your settlements. I would honestly advise playing your villages up to the next spring and saving there before you install this third content update. Now, because I don't want to crush you completely, I will skip the fuel and settlers aging systems for now and go over to the subjects which will cheer you up and which you have been requesting for months, visual variety in structures. The developers have added a totally new system where when you click on constructed objects like walls, roofs, floors and even fences and marylands, you can change their shape and rotation at a click of a button. No rebuilding, no resource usage, the stats of the object remain the same, but the looks change. And there are half a dozen options of each of those. You can now have rounded pillars, as well as several combinations of round and square ones. On top of this, the roofs now have material variations, which are visible on their flat sides. You can finally fit the roof appearance with the wall section appearance, so they don't look out of place. Another welcome addition in this regard are clay brick and limestone brick arches, which do the same job as wooden beams. I cannot wait to see what you will create with these new options and I will be happy to showcase your settlements, castles or single large structures in my player construction showcase series. You can send the save files or screenshots to the email address in the description. One important note here is that corner melarons and corner fences are no longer buildable by themselves, but are a visual variation of the regular ones. This means that when you load up your game, you will probably have some missing marylands and fences which have to be replaced. 
On the interface side of things, you'll be happy to know that the camera will no longer jump to the location of a merchant when one comes to your map, and that it will remember which map layer you were on when you load your save file. And speaking of the merchant, when you barter with them or have sent your own caravan to barter, the trade window will now have sorting arrows. You can use these to sort items by name, cost or quantity. The items you cannot trade will be pushed to the bottom of the window and this is by default now. Another UI improvement are the tooltips which should be better looking and less intrusive. One more visual change comes in the form of Hallardry and your settlement symbol being painted on shields and plate armor. Even if you take them off enemy raiders, once your settlers equip them, their appearance is changed automatically. Settlers from other factions will also now have their own settlement Hallardry painted on their shields and armor. And all the visitors to your settlement will now have a percentage of women and not just men as it was up to now. When it comes to equipment and warfare items, you'll be happy to learn that silver weapons, armor and shields have been added with this update and they have their own unique color. You can now mine for silver, smelt it and craft with it. The items you make will have a quality level between gold and iron or steel, so not very good, but still with more armor rating, weapon damage and durability than gold versions. Just remember that you need to start a new save to be able to find silver on maps. Old saves and old maps won't have it. One more thing about equipment that is new in this update are metal shields like bucklers, kites and regular shields. You'll be able to craft them out of gold, silver, iron and steel. On top of those new items, enemies will bring in uncraftable bone armor like animal headpieces, headbands and a few other things. Seems after all this, I will have to make an additional weapons and armor guide. My previous one is linked up here and in the description for your viewing pleasure. Before I move on to the second half of changes and additions, I want to ask you to use that like button and subscribe if you're new to my channel for more content like this. And do let me know in the comments on which map type will you start a new settlement after this update. As for new production, community buildings, workstations, there are four new ones. On the production side, those are the Icebox and Skep. Icebox lets you produce actual ice blocks, which can be used to lower room temperature or sold for great value in the summertime. The icebox does require temperatures of minus 1 degree Celsius or 30 Fahrenheit to even operate. And if it is colder than that, you can produce ice blocks faster. This is as close as we have gotten to water in Going Medieval, but don't hold your breath for running water or rivers just yet. The other new production workbench is the Skep. Here your settlers will be able to make honey and wax with some help from bees. Temperatures work differently than with the icebox. If it's too cold, bees don't produce anything. As for skills necessary, this is where animal husbandry finally comes into play because it is now added into the jobs panel and it is a requirement for operating the scap. But to even craft these workstations and production buildings, you first need to unlock the required tech in the reorganized research panel, beekeeping for the scap and ice making for the icebox. The two new community type buildings slash workstations are the merchant stall and the caravan halt. These are great additions for several reasons. You will no longer have to run after the merchant across your map, but easily find him settled in his stall and start your bartering there. The caravan halt helps you with two things, forming a caravan and dismantling it. So new resources won't be dumped at the edge of the map once your settler returns from their trade missions, but placed at the halt for your convenience. With so many new additions to the gameplay across the board, there is a number of new craftable foods and items your settlers can make now. From barley, bread can be made, a staple of medieval cuisine. From apples, you can make apple pie, but also apple cider. No skill requirement if you have a brewing station going. And there, mead, skill level 15, can also be made from honey. So two new drinks. Another pie type can be made from red currants, while honey crisps can be made from raw honey. It can be eaten raw as well, but you might want to keep it for production of basic medicates. 
Wax, which is another product of the merchant's caps, is now used for refueling candles, a topic I will cover in a moment. Refueling candles can be done with tallow as well, which is gained from butchering big animals. Another use for tallow is making basic medikits just like with honey. In this update, settlers themselves have also been changed substantially and some of their modifiers and states tweaked. The most important of these is of course the aging process. They aged before, but it wasn't important because they couldn't die from old age. Now, if they are older than 65 and have slept longer than 3 hours, they roll the dice with the Grim Reaper before waking up. The more times they win this roll, the lower their chances for survival drop until they finally don't wake up. These odds are moldable, so you can change them if you want to give your settlers a few more years. But let's face it, being 65 years old in the medieval era is like 120 today, and with all that hard work they do each day, it's just a kindness to let them drift off in their sleep. To make the aging process, young, adult, middle-aged and senior more interesting, the developers have added different modifiers which also depend on settlers' height and weight. They will now have a chance to gain random perks on their birthdays. Happy 64th birthday! You now have a green thumb, go out and harvest 900 cabbage by winter. <laughs> that would be funny. Do note they won't be able to gain perks which would mess up the playthrough like Cannibal for example. No one needs a settler getting hungry on human flesh all of a sudden in their peaceful playthrough. Another totally new thing for settlers in Going Medieval is dreaming. From now on they can sometimes have good or bad dreams which result in actual mood modifiers. Dreams also depend on settlers perks like gluttonous, cannibal and bloodlust. This last one is finally going to work as intended and your settler with it will get a positive mood modifier when killing someone. Now I have a bad news, good news situation for you about the settlers. Rebellious and merry settler states are now tweaked so that they happen on chance if the conditions for them are met. This means that a settler only has a 50% chance to become rebellious when his mood drops to its minimum and this roll is made again as soon as he gets a new negative mood modifier. This will let you have time to fix things before it's too late if you are lucky enough. And it works very similarly for the merry mood state. After you pass the 80% mark for positive mood, there will be a 50% roll and again for every new positive mood modifier until the settler becomes merry. Now for the bad news. A daily maximum is introduced on experience points one settler can get on an individual skill. So if you have a settler planting many new crops today and he earns 1600 XP on botany, each next XP point is reduced by 90% until tomorrow. I know this will be a huge annoyance to many or most of you and I count myself one of you. But on the other hand, think of it in the big picture. Your settlers won't live forever anymore anyway, so leveling them up to 50 on multiple skills is no longer an option as you won't have the time to do so. We are slowly transitioning from gameplay where you create a perfect settlement with perfect settlers to playthroughs which last much longer and with generations of normal proper settlers. I think this will enrich the gameplay and while it will take some time to get used to it, this will ultimately make the game better. Another thing that is added about skills and experience is the K. This means that for settlers who have skills past level 5, but don't use them, they will lose experience gained inside that skill level. So if you have a melee skill of 9 and 500 XP points in it, but switch the settler to a ranged weapon, after a while he will still have melee skill weapon 9, but with 0 XP progress to the 10th skill level. This will be even more pronounced on old settlers, which is only natural. And now we come to the change update 3 brings which might end up annoying you the most of all depending on your settlement design. The dreaded fuel system. From now on both light and heat sources will require your settlers to refuel them. This means braziers, torches and candles. For braziers and torches you can use coal, wood and sticks, while for candles only choices are tallow and wax. But it's not that simple. 
Because tallow is not as good for candles as wax is, you will need more of it. It's the same with braziers and torches, where you need far less coal or wood than sticks. Your stewards will be responsible for refueling, but I wouldn't be too worried about the time spent on that, but rather on the quantity of resources you need to have on hand. Increasing your resource storage might be a problem for your already constructed and completed settlement projects, not to mention those where you have left no access to braziers, torches and candles, like some of the castles and settlements I have showcased in my previous videos. I do hope that this video will be of great use to you to find your way back into going medieval after the new resources and cultivation content update 3. I know I will need a while to get my own settlement sorted with all these changes to some of the core gameplay mechanics. I will keep posting my let's plays of previous playthroughs, but I will also start a brand new one. If you have suggestions for the settlement's name or design, leave them in the comments below. Thank you for watching and happy gaming!